here on Ernie's Corner, but where is Ernie? And it looks like we have got all these beautiful logos. Kind of feel like I'm in a candy store. I see Cheech and Chong's Big Bamboo, and then I see the Flying Tigers that Ernie and I talked about. Also, uh, oh, Bite Down Hard. That is great from JoJo Gunn. And I know Ernie has got a lot to share about the great designs that he and Pacific Eye and Ear have done over the years. Just go ahead and glance at them right now. Yeah, there's Hi, Ernie. Joyce. Hey, Ernie. What I'm here. You, you didn't levitate yourself out of here, did you? No, not not yet. I, I wanted to give everybody a chance. You know, I mean, they, they see my ugly puss every week. It no. would be nice if, if they can, you know, get a chance to sort of look at some of the logos. I mean, uh, like you and I had talked about uh, when we were talking about doing this segment, I mean, I had never really looked back uh, until the Internet. I never really looked back at anything I did. Uh, lately, um, I started I started counting the logos that I've done, the corporate identities, both in music, branding and music for rock bands and, and, and musicians, and then in corporate America. So, and it came out over the course of, it took me about a month because I had to look back over a lot of stuff. There's thousands of images and things that we had done. And um, I, I came up with a count, which was uh, around, you know, 500, a little over 530 different logos and branding that I've created, you know? And so what you're looking at there is me looking back at, my career, 53 years. So if I've done 530 logos in 53 years, it comes out to about 10 logos a year. That is a lot is, of logos. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, mildly putting it, yeah, it's quite a few. And you know, you, it doesn't, when you say, well, 10 logos a year, well, I mean, somebody could do five logos in a month, but it never really kind of worked out that way. The way it worked out was, a more fluid kind of thing because it's just how it worked out in my career. I mean, it never really, it never got jammed and crammed where I had to set, I had to settle for something that I wasn't really happy with. I was able to, because of the corporate world moving at a different pace than the music world, um, it gave me the opportunity to do 10 logos a year, you know, which I, and I, yeah, I, there could have been a year where I did, you know, three or four in a month or two months, but taking a national average, uh, you know, <laughs> it comes out to 10 logos a year. And, you know, it's, it's really kind of, um, it's kind of thrilling for me because like I said, it, I look at it sometimes and I, and each piece, you know, brings back memories. Each piece was something very special in my life. Uh, you know, it's like, if you have children and, you know, you're asked to pick your favorite child, you know, maybe you can, maybe you can't. You know, for me, I don't have children. These are my children. What you're looking at there is a couple dozen of my 530 plus children. And I can't really pick one over the other because each one has a special place. OK, it's just like if I had kids, I'm sure I'd be the same way, unless that kid was raised like I was a demon. So I would probably, uh, you know, want to put him in reform school or something. But, uh, you know, he's still my child. So, you know, they're, they're, every one of them has a special place. Not every one of them is great, but every one of them is special to me. So I wanted to sort of take a few minutes off camera so people can see these because they're really when you start getting into it, you start going, my God, you know, they, I just didn't do album covers. I just didn't do logos for the Bee Gees or Alice Cooper or, you know, Black Sabbath. I did logos for major corporations like Coca-Cola and, you know, and, and Avery Dennison, which is a, you, you know, the uh, label company. I worked for them for nine years, worked for Nestle for 30 years in doing all these different logos and branding and messaging. And so it's been a very diverse career and looking back through the logos, connecting them, it, it was really amazing because, you know, you could see how they evolved, how, how it went from music. It started in corporate, then went to music, then back to corporate, and then just a nice balance of the two. And then 
music kind of went away and corporate became more more popular in my life and, and more work to be done. You know, the music industry for us changed. Um, I'm going to come back in the screen here now. Uh, How you have appeared. This is amazing. Huh? It's magic. What? I did appear. I levitated in with a chair. That levitation is really <laughs> something, you know. I tell you, see, see, Burton Cummings taught you. That's what it is. Yes, exactly. And we had a hell of a time trying to levitate him out of that chair. Oh, no. That's, a, that's yeah. another story, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. I Didn't we talk about it? I mean, we, we sure you know, did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Taking that stair, that, that chair downstairs, two flights in my place, and then up three flights in his place, and this little tiny walkway you know go staircase going up that was crazy but yeah levitation is uh, something that i don't really specialize in but i do from time to time so anyway you know it's just been an interesting thing for me because the funny thing is choice that i never really liked lettering and i think i we may have talked about that, you know, and that surprises you know, with, me because you're so good at it well yeah you know i guess it's like something that you you know you don't look forward to doing my mother used to get me sign painting jobs you know, uh, with her friends, we the Catuzos owned a little market at the you know in our neighborhood, and they were best friends. And they would get me to do these signs that said you know green beans thirty five cents a pound or whatever that we'd put up in the store, and then you know signage that would actually go out in front, you know. And and I just hated it. I just really, you know, I remember there were a half a dozen jobs like that 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 you know she was trying. God bless her soul. She was just trying to help. But it was something that I never really liked. I was never really that good at it. And I always depended on, well, before when I was in college, it was rub down type where you get the sheets of type and you rub down the different letters to make the words. And, you know, and so it went from that to setting type, you know, uh, but then you become it's very limited when you look to type fonts. And now I'm talking about the late sixties and early seventies where there weren't a whole lot of typefaces. There were standard faces like Helvetica and Futura and things like that, that you could get in certain point sizes. And so I kind of depended on that in the advertising part of it. Okay. If you look at dolls alive, that was one of the first times I was able to use phototype the dolls alive logo, that lettering, was not hand lettered it was phototype and what happened was linotype which is all the type fonts and the sizes was like a newspaper you typed it up and it went and melt let it a uh, lead block melted and it set the type on top and it set it in signatures and that's how you printed it then all of a sudden phototype came along which was like this negative strip of different letters and they would it, it would be like just exposing a, a, photo, a photograph from a negative to a print. So they had a strip of type that was negative and they would project it onto a photographic piece of paper that would put the font, the letter and the font right there on the paper. That was phototype. Dolls Live for me was kind of like, wow, you know, this is, I don't have to depend on Helvetica and Futura and Universe and, and just those fonts. Now there's an opportunity to do this kind of thing. And, and then what happened was very different. If you, the next thing that I did that was really kind of big after that was Jesus Christ Superstar. And that font is a Times Roman. It was a set font. I didn't letter it. And, wow. but then that album not only changed the course of my career, but it forced me to do more hand lettering and I, there was a, there was a group called Matthews Southern Comfort. Oh, I don't they're know. fabulous, Ian Matthews yeah. Woodstock. Yes, exactly. And so I did an album for them shortly after Woodstock, Matthews Southern Comfort, and I did this rendering of wood. And then I, I couldn't get phototype or even a, a set font to look right. So I hand lettered Matthews Southern Comfort on the album, and it was like, hey, I could do this. You know, this isn't bad. Now I don't have to depend on linotype. I don't have to depend on phototype. I can hand letter stuff. So it was really, you know, taking it from something that I, I never really liked and was never really good at to where something that I love doing. The music business, the album cover business gave me the opportunity to do, to go from Jesus Christ Superstar to Matthew's Southern Comfort to the Rolling Stones logo, to uh, 
to a career in album covers where I've done all these logos. And then not only was I elated about that, but I actually carried it over into the corporate world where, you know, with, with the, all these different companies that we work for. Panavision is a, is it, you'll see their logo back there. That was a company. Panavision was a, a major, major, and we'll do a show on that. I have to pull all the stuff out, but we were the agency for them for nine years. And we did some amazing stuff. And there's a guy named Andy Romanoff that I think I talked about before. He was Captain Gas in the hog farm with Wavy Gravy and all those guys. And he turned out to be the marketing director at Panavision oh years my, later. That is, that's a revelation. Yeah, there. yeah, you know, I'm looking, we're sitting, we get the account, right? And I've got a mohawk now because we celebrated <laughs> getting the account. So we got drunk, uh, uh, Rick, Rick Lynch, a, a, a designer that was working with me. Uh, and he's another story. He went on to great stuff. But uh, we decided that because we got that Panavision account, we were going to celebrate and get mohawk. So we started drinking to, uh, vodka at like 630 in the morning. 10 o'clock, the guy came over and gave us both Mohawks. Two days later, we're in a conference at Panavision. Oh, <laughs> and my. I got this Mohawk, and it was Frank, uh, it was um, Jack Holzman from Electra Records. Yeah. He had sold Electra to Warner. Warner put him on the board of Kenny, and then they put him in charge of Panavision, which was going through a very major change in um the audience, the guy who owned the company before Frank Gottschalk, really, he ran Panavision like Studio 54. If he liked you and you had the right look, he'd let you rent one of his cameras. If not, go somewhere else, go to Mitchell, go to Aeroflex. He didn't care. So that really hurt him. And when Warner Brothers bought them, they put Jack in charge of running it and getting them back in the game. And so the first thing Jack did was called us. We had done a lot of work for him at Electra, and uh, we started working with Panavision. And I'm, I'm sitting in this meeting with the Mohawk, and I'm looking at this guy who's the marketing director, and I'm going, man, that guy looks really familiar. I just don't know where, where do I know that guy from? Turns out he's Captain Gas from the hog farm, you know, and now he's the head of marketing at Panavision. So we had a great setup there, you know. So there's, there were companies like that. Their logo was terrible. When I first took over that account, it looked, and I'm sure this is how it was created. It was created like on a draft by a draftsman on a drafting table. And each letter looked different than the letter, the rest of the letter. So it wasn't a font. It was all these different letters that this guy on a drafting table lettered out. So I needed to make it better. And I, I knew if I asked, I would never be able to do it because it's Panavision, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's like sacred. So I just went ahead and changed it anyway, a little bit at a time. Over the course of two or three years, I completely changed it and nobody ever found out. And then I created the new format, which had all the film and video uh, formats on it with Panavision in the middle. But nobody ever questioned it because I did it slowly. I'm, I'm a firm believer in always begging forgiveness than asking permission. You ask permission and that just stunts creativity because you're asking permission from people that are hiring you to tell them what they need to do. So they're not gonna, they're not gonna they're not gonna be able to give you the answer. And so the, automatically they're gonna go, no, you can't touch that logo. It's like sacred. I did the same thing with Aerosmith. You see the Aerosmith logo oh, there. Yes. Did yes. the same thing. We talked about that. Mm -hmm. You know, I just when I first got it, you couldn't read it. So I slowly changed it and Toys in the Attic was if you look at the album before Toys in the Attic and the logos before that, you'll see the difference. And then on rocks, it was just subtle little differences that made it read better, you know. And so I think that I'm very proud of all my children. You know, I mean, they're just really they're such a variety of different images and in different industries. I mean, Coca-Cola, I don't know how well you can see that one in the upper in this corner right here but that's that's a project we did for coca-cola they flew us into atlanta bob ingleseep and the guy that works with me does all the finishing they flew us to atlanta to make a presentation to 14 countries and bob hates talking in public right so we get up there on the podium and i introduce myself and then i introduce bob and said okay bob take it away and he's like, you know, and he, and these, you know, it was, it was like being in the UN. Everybody had these ear things on so they could understand. They were from 14 different countries that Coca-Cola wanted to put a presence in major shopping centers and airports. Okay. They had already done something where 
uh, it was uh, an area where you could go. Now, this is probably 15 years ago, 15 years ago, where uh, cell phones were real popular. You needed to charge them and all that stuff. So an Internet, you needed access. And maybe it was a little quicker than 15. I, I get kind of confused. I could look it up for sure. But but they had a couple in airports where it was like a Coca-Cola zone where you could go in and sit down. You could, you know, there were tables, there were uh, hook-ins for you charging your phone. There was, you know, all these different things that you could, you know, do and be in this area. The problem was that you looked like you were in a Coca-Cola ad. I mean, there was Coke, big banners that said, Coke. I mean, it was like really... So we came in and changed it. We called it the hub. I created that logo that you see behind me that looks like it's the green glass from the old Coke bottle. I mean, they loved it. And, and we put together a, a, I'm not sure if it's in there, but if it isn't, I'll make sure that we see it. It's a whole area that we designed with all these interactive things going on. It was like going into, it was like going into a circus with all these different experiences going on. And, and we sent out on the internet, uh, um, you know, looking for content because there are all these creative people out there that are putting stuff up online and hoping somebody will discover them. So what we did was we solicited, you know, these pieces from everybody out there. Uh, and you submit them. We looked at them. If they were cool, we put them on. And it was amazing. We built one. We built one in Argentina. And it was amazing. It was like really cool. And then uh, the economy went into the dumper and the guy that had brought us in left and <laughs> we got, we went with him. And that's kind of always what happens. If I look oh, back over my career, shame. Which, it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, you very well know you were in that corporate world as well. And you know that there comes a time if there's change and we were talking about that, how change is good when you're young change is not good. When you get older, change is not good. Your body's changing. Everything's changing, you know, and you want to be, you're just looking for stability and secure <laughs> security at that time, you know? So, um, you know, it, it was throughout my career, the way I I've said before, you know, being in the right spot at the right time is critical and that's timing is everything. And it works the other way, too. You know, it's not always a good thing. It can be a bad thing. And that's usually when change happens and things change. And I mean, I, I look back over my career and I see where there were opportunities that happened and I was in the right spot at the right time. And then you look back over it from another angle and I was in the wrong spot at the wrong time, at the right time. You know, I mean, it was it just happens. I mean. We, when we were doing work for, um, for InBev, you'll see some stuff down here in the lower corner. Uh, there's some, I, I was doing packaging and branding and messaging for ba a Bex, Bass, Stella Artois, Rolling Rock, Kokanee, um, Brahma, all these different beer brands. And we did, we were specifically focused and initially focused on, ba on Bex because Bex was really suffering. It had become your grandfather's beer. Nobody was drinking it. And so what we did was there was a guy that I had worked with at, at Nestle and he brought me to Kmart. He brought me to these other places. He brought me to InBev and they brought, brought us in and we had this big meeting and we decided that we were going to take Bex and make it today make it more contemporary. We were doing things like hiring LL Cool J to do some stuff for us down in South Beach. I mean, we really we really got into it. It was life beckons and you're holding the key because their logo was this little key and a shield. And, and we moved that brand. And, and one of the other things we did, when going back to asking permission versus, you know, begging forgiveness, is one of the things that we did was one of the guys that was on the team had been there before us and Mike kept him on uh, because he had a great connection with the brewery in Germany. And so what we did was we did these secret focus groups in Texas, uh, Chicago. Um, we were in um, Kentucky. Uh, we were in California with focus groups to find out what people felt about Beck's beer. And the big number one thing was it was too bitter. 
American palates don't really go for, on a whole, don't really go for bitter beer. Yeah, that's um, true. And so what we did was, instead of trying to relay that information that we had gathered from these five or six focus groups we did, um, we just decided that we needed to lower the beer, the, the, the bitterness level. And if we asked permission from Germany, it would never happen. And actually, it would have been Belgium because Belgium owned Bex and, and owned InBev. Then they sold it to Brazil uh, after, after we left or as we were leaving. But we just went ahead and had I, M Reiner, who was uh, on our team that was communicating with the brewery, tell them, hey, look, we need to go ahead and lower the bitterness level on this beer. And by four or five points, I mean, which is like, you know, and so they went ahead and did it. The next batch of beer that came in right away, we went and did focus groups and found out exactly the opposite. People loved it. So we just put it out there. We never told corporate and they started seeing the sales going up and, you know, they didn't know why. And eventually I think they had a marketing in North America. Mike Harrington went ahead and told them, but that's at when that you point, tell them. <laughs> yeah. And, and, that, and yeah, that's the right time that's you tell the them. Right I remember, time. I remember another instance like that at Nestle when we took over, um, we, the same guy who was head of marketing at Nestle confections was the same guy that was at InBev. He was a risk taker. His name is Mike Harrington, probably one of the most brilliant marketing people on the planet. Graduated top of his class at West Point. Guy is just strategic like crazy. He got when he he was in uh, pastas and sauces for Nestle, and then he got moved over into confections. And he, um, the predecessor to him, had said, you know, there's this opportunity with Nestle. Uh, I mean, with uh, with um, with uh, Disney, there's an opportunity with Disney to get involved somehow with one of our brands and this new movie that they have coming out. My advice to you would be to steer clear of it. Stay away. OK, we don't this not when that person had moved on. That was the legacy that he had left and the messaging he had left for Mike. So Mike called me in and we decided that we were going to go over to Disney and take a look at some of the rushes from this film. And it turned out to be Lion King. Oh, my heavens. Which was, oh yeah, but it, we were looking at roughs in part animation, part color, part black and white, you know, very little music. And Mike said, you know, this is a great opportunity. We need to figure out what we're going to do. So we decided that we would take, because part of what we saw was rough black and white animation. And then there was some color to give you a look and feel. And um, yeah, we got nine minutes, huh? Okay. Yes, I'm going to hurry. Nine, I'm going to hurry up. Minutes. I'm going to hurry up. <laughs> uh, and so um, what, you know, what we decided to do was take frames from the film and convert them to black and white line art and make em, uh, embossing dyes the same way you would get a Nestle bar and it would say Nestle on it. We put frames from the film of Lion King into the candy. Okay, so that when you got, and we did special packaging on the front, they gave us the brand that we used was a Nestle milk chocolate. It was the, the least popular brand they had butterfinger they had all these other you know payday all these other um, uh, uh, brands that were much more uh, accepted it was kind of like beck's beer you know uh this was a, a candy brand that was i think number 25 on the on the top 100 or whatever it was a delicious bar but anyway they gave us that bar to work with so it was perfect we took frames from the film, made line art, made embossing dies, and put those frames into the into the candy and did special packaging. And so when you got it, you took it out of the package, beautiful foil wrapped and beautiful labels. And it was here were these frames from the movie in the bar. Well, they had sold, I think it was somewhere around $30 million worth of chocolate in a year, that brand. We did $30 million in the first 60 days of that film and that release because we coincided the two 
and, and leverage the equity of, of all of that we were doing with the candy bars because it had never really been done like that before. And then it did so well that we did toys, uh, Toy Story and we did Pocahontas, <laughs> you know, uh, same kind of thing. And then my guy left, went to Kmart and I went with him. <laughs> so, so innovative. That is yeah. just absolutely innovative. Yeah. Well, you know, it was it was it was kind of it was kind of a no brainer because, you know, you want to do something disruptive. You you don't want to just put it on the packaging. It was like that with album covers. I just didn't want to put a clever picture on the album cover. It needed to have more. It needed to involve the consumer, the fan, whatever you want to call that person. It needed to get them more emotionally connected. And when you can do that, you've got something pretty special. We did that in the record business and we carried it over into corporate America. So, you know, that's that's kind of and and there is a like story for each one of these images that you see here, whether it's music or corporate. And again, this is a few dozen, a couple dozen of over 530 different ones. So and um, one thing that Joyce and I wanted to make available to all our wonderful neighbors on the block is if you like this background, it's not high res. OK, but it's it's big enough. And if let me see if I can go to that one, Joyce, I'm going to so, show the bigger one now. Uh, let's see. If you would like, we will send you, you email either Joyce or I, and you, we will send you this image. Uh, here it is bigger, I think. I think this is the one. That is so generous of you, Ernie. Oh, no, I think it's something. Yeah, now, you can see right there. Oh, that's nice. I it's a lot screen. cleaner. It's a lot clearer. I have a screen. It's not really, really huge, but it's big, and it looks great. It's just not high resolution, but it would make a great screensaver. I have to check with my guy that does computer stuff, but even getting it as an email, it's, it's good enough to just email. So if you like this and you'd like to have it, you know, reach out to Joyce and I, and let's see, am I, I, am I guess I'm, yeah, I'm done. I, well, I'm not done, but I, I'm going to leave it big <laughs> like that. So <clears throat> just email her, email me. You've got my Facebook page you can email me there or you can do it at ernie at hornbook.com uh hornbook inc i-n-k not i-n-c so ernie at hornbook inc i-n-k dot com or joyce yes. and we'll send you this in an email you know not just, my just email for our neighbors Facebook. Yeah, just for our neighbors and i want to thank them all for following me and Ernie's Corner and I hear a lot from them and and you know what Joyce every show the views the ones that I post go up they're going up. They never got less. There's never been one that's been less than the one before it. So, or after it, you know, so you're doing a great job. And so are you, you know, people are becoming really intrigued. I, I like when I hear, I never knew that that is really <coughs> something, you know, cause you're really getting the story. You're getting that great backstory and uh, uh, Ernie, you know, when it comes to songs, you started mentioning Beck's beer. Yeah. Ah, clean well, living in heaven. There is no beer, but with with uh, Ernie and me, you've got plenty of it. Well, I when it comes to the song, you know, I've got to hear. My this. father hear was it. a huge. My father was a huge influence in my life, and you know, I was lucky enough to have him be alive enough to see me start making something out of what his my mom and he had invested in all these years, and. I, I'm a huge fan of Jim Croce, okay? And he's a, he's a talent that went far too soon. Yeah, and I had read something a while back about his father. And his father had had a dream for him of being a success, okay? And, be, and before he could become a success, his father passed. Right after his father passed, he had three hits in the same year. He had... Um, uh, bad, bad Louis, Leroy Brown, all in 1973. Bad, bad Leroy Brown. He had I've Got a Name and Time in a Bottle. All three of those are amazing. But the one that resonates to me more than anything, because Jim didn't write this song. He did it because of what it said about his love for his father. And I would like us to play that one. And that one is I've Got a Name. You got it. 
Okay. And any other ones that you want to play, but Jim Croce was just an amazing talent. And I loved his songs. The first time I heard him, I said, it was like, you know, it's going to be a hit. You know, this guy's going to be big. And then he was gone, you know, it, 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 but luckily my dad lived long enough, like I said, to see me start making, it was mainly in um, the music business, but my mom kept, and he kept a stack of records underneath the TV stand. And anytime anybody came over, they'd pull that stack of records out and go through each one of them with, with their company. You know, they were so proud. And, That's beautiful. and I think that, you know, that that means so much to me and i think it means a lot to you and everybody out there all our neighbors we have that connection to make us who we are today that helped us along the way and my parents had every reason to put me in an orphanage believe me uh and they didn't they were like sister mary lucy she kept faith and faith and hope is really what it's all about and i've got a name is all about that so if we could hear that one and any other one that you want to play with it, you know, it's fine. I've got a name. That is my pleasure, Ernie. It's just the way the logos speak, you know, that you put that personal touch in there and you that that name goes to the company and it goes personally as well, yeah. too, because you are in those logos in so many ways. Yeah. Even yeah. Though well, and our, our, we've got wonderful neighbors, neighbors, and I, that's why I want to, you know, I'm, I'm not doing it because I've got an ego. I'm doing it because I'd love, I mean, when you see these big on a screen, they're really nice. And if forget about that somebody did them. They're just really a great collaboration of all these different, like a montage of these different images. So Joyce will have it. I'll have it to our neighbors. If you want it, we'll send it to you. 